Hi, I'm Bess Godin, and welcome to Millennial Splaining. So, I bet you're wondering, who is this bitch? Who died and made her the ultimate authority to speak for her entire generation? Well, the answer is, I'm nobody. I have no authority whatsoever. Like so many millennials, I was told to get an education. Then, I graduated into a barren and opportunityless economy. We are the most overeducated and underemployed. The greatest minds of my generation go unheard. They are too busy serving coffee, flipping burgers, moving boxes, babysitting, and pumping gas to survive. All the while applying to better jobs that they are also overqualified for, but for which they know they'll never get an interview. And finally, at the end of a long day, we have time not to relax, but to work on our blogs and YouTube channels so we can have some modicum of expression in a world where we are told daily that we are disposable. And with each of these desperate efforts to grab hold of the national microphone, we find ourselves slipping further and further away from it because the world doesn't want to hear our problems. By corporate reinforced choice, we are a generation lost in obscurity. So hi, Tara. Thank you so much for joining me on Millennial Explaining. Hi, it's nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you really for coming. Really looking forward to talking to you. Um, I I did just read your book. I absolutely love it. Um, left out when the truth doesn't fit in, right? That's the title. Um, and uh, I yep. was immediately struck by how beautifully written it was. I just wanted to say that. Um, we'll start We'll start okay. this interview off with a couple compliments. Throw you some softballs, how about that? <laughs> That's okay. That sounds great. That sounds great. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate that you like the book. Yeah. Yes. So yes. I would encourage anyone who gets it on Amazon, the Evil Empire, to uh, to overtake <laughs> the trolls that were on it and uh, leave a review if you read it. So thank you. I actually just did yesterday. I left a a, a glowing oh, review. Sweet. So yes, oh, <laughs> please everyone Thanks. go do that because it's an excellent book. It's an yeah. excellent book. So, um, yeah, and uh, as a disclaimer to everyone watching right now, um, you know, if you don't know the story behind Tara uh, and what happened to her with Biden, if you don't, uh, you know, if you think you have any doubts or whatever, please go read her book. Please go watch uh, the interview that she did with Katie Halper, okay? Because if you don't believe her after those things, I, I don't know what's wrong with you. She's the most credible person even over Christine Blasey Ford, I thought that I've heard in a long time. So um, uh, yes, <laughs> I cannot, I cannot support you more, Tara. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. I support, I support Dr. Ford as, as I do, but, but I appreciate the observation that she, um, she's gotten a lot of support where pretty much the whole I feel like the entire half the country turned their back on me. So yeah. It's yeah. Kind of stunning actually. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it makes me, I mean, I have several things that, you know, I'd like to discuss on that issue, but like, you know, for, for the one thing that makes me angry that because I, you know, I, I feel like you didn't fit into the narrative of, what we were expecting to hear from a survivor. Maybe that was part of it as well. I mean, it's not only, I mean, it's, you know, definitely because the Democrats like throttled you in every, in every way. I mean, they just cut off mm -hmm. your knee, knee capture access at every point. So, you know, like that's, that's number, number one, but, <laughs> but, you know, I think that for, you know, Christine Blasey Ford, you know, because she, uh, you know, you know, did the, the whole, um, I don't know. She just, she just sort of appeared like, you know, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm upset, but I'm affected. And like, that was just like the one note that we saw of her. Right. Whereas like you are a whole person. Like I, I see you and I see, you know, a woman who's tender, a woman who's funny, a woman who's smart, you know, and like, I, I think that that's evident in everything that you do. And, you know, not that, that Dr. Ford is in all those things as well, but the way, I mean, just the way that, you know, we saw her on the news compared to the way that I experienced you to begin with, I immediately related to you, you know, right off the bat. I, I felt like, you know, a lot of people, uh, 
I, I felt like a lot of women in my generation did as well because we, you know, we really felt like, you know, that things had been happening to us for a long time and that we were being silenced about them for a long time. And then when you came out, we just felt like, yes, like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yeah. um, anyway, I'll, I'll stop my, my blowing smoke right now, but <laughs> um, I, uh, yeah, I mean, like that was particularly why I was interested to have you on because I, I'm, you know, I think that when history you know, looks back at you after we're all long gone, you know, they're going to see a feminist hero. I really believe that well, because thank you. we all, you know, are, you. You know okay. yeah, yeah, honestly, seriously, because we are, you know, like we all felt seen, I think, by you in a, in a lot of ways, you know, the people who were paying mm -hmm. attention. So, yeah. Um, so why don't you tell me a little bit uh, if you want to just like give an intro or uh, I don't know. I just felt like I talked a lot for there a minute. <laughs> um do you you want to say anything off the bat or i'm um, sure you know like like i appreciate it i feel like that the ship is kind of turning in the sense that a lot of corruption is being exposed right now through um the reporting that J jody Cantor did um regarding times up and the leadership and the corruption um and their embeddedness with the democratic party so you're seeing a lot of what i was been kind of yelling into the void for the last few months or actually two years um mm -hmm. It's true. And um, Alison Tricos is an amazing activist who, along with another Time's Up person, you know, you know, got us kind of all together with that letter. And I think that letter was very powerful. And one of the things we asked is that the board stepped down and they did. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's pretty, I, I, it kind of shows you, it gives you hope that no matter how big the machine is, you can expose the corruption um, and you can be heard if you try, but you have to be persistent. You have to be patient and you have to be, you know, resilient and you have to be, you know, you just have to have to keep going. And, and I have kept going. I mean, I've just not stopped. So, and my message has been clear from the beginning that I wasn't just, when I came forward about Joe Biden, it didn't just become about Joe Biden. It's about every person standing behind me trying to come forward about a powerful person that utilizes a machine to shut them down and to um, marginalize them and to destroy them for, for telling the truth. Um, and, you know, this, this country has no respect for whistleblowers and that's the problem. So. No respect yeah. for whistleblowers, no respect for women who don't fit in, no mm -hmm. respect for people who don't fit into the narrative, you know, in general um absolutely percent right. yeah uh so um yeah and one of the things also that struck me about your story is that um i you know it, it, i it seems to me like i'm blow i'm gonna blow more spoke here but <laughs> um i you know you are such a smart and uh you know intelligent passionate writer that you know it's it makes me angry that i didn't find out about you because you wrote a great novel you know what i'm saying like it makes me angry that you know you had these experiences and because of that you you were sort of kneecapped in life in a lot of different ways and i know that you had other traumas that you were dealing with and had other life experiences that also contributed to your situation but like i you know i know that this this was a part of it and but this was probably the beginning i did talk to um professor zankis uh a little while ago and we talked about complex trauma and i mean i i definitely feel that from a different perspective because i you know i took care of my parents when they were um, dying of cancer. And then I also took care of my grandfather. Uh, so, you know, I understand what it's like to sort of like get the first trauma and then get a little bit more and a little bit more, a little bit more, you know, and that first trauma really messes you up. <laughs> and again, like, I'm not trying yeah. to make it, and I don't know, you know, the specifics, but I, I, you know, I mean, that, that was huge. And the fact that, you know, your fight to come out was so difficult um, you know, I really do hope a tide is turning. I, I really do. And I, I think, you know, with the Cuomo thing and um, 
with with Tina Chen, right? As she stepped down. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's and Hillary uh, Rosen has stepped down. Oh, yeah. excellent! I didn't hear that. Great, great. Yes. Yeah. But and the entire board stepped down Friday um, of Times Up. So, wow. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. You know, oh it's interesting. God. It's interesting because I have a journal and I made a list of names. You know, I wanted restorative justice and I made a list of names that I wanted, you know, some justice about. And I just ticked off all the names except what? Biden. So now we got to do Biden. Yes. Oh, my so God. So time's up. You know, and, and I don't feel like there's been total restorative justice for us, but I feel like them stepping down was a huge huge statement and it also makes me wonder legally like geez what are they hiding from and running from so <laughs> that's it so that'll be found out yeah yeah so to be sure the skeletons that you see are not all of them that are in that closet for sure exactly mm -hmm. exactly so i would say you know that we're we're heading in the right direction but now we have to keep going we really have to galvanize always been willing to go under oath and i hope there's an investigation into joe biden it takes one member of congress and i think that we're getting closer to that reality and i hope that we do so yes yes i hope so too there are so few uh success stories i mean and not that this is a success story yet by any means but i mean that's a huge step and you know it's <laughs> you know uh, it's definitely a glimmer of light in a, a darkening world so that's that's exciting to me to hear yeah, the time's up stepping down yeah they do we still need accounting we need a forensic accounting of how they spent the money times of legal defense fund they have 25 million what are they doing with it who have they helped who have they not helped where is that money who enriched themselves with those donations we need yeah. to know and um so there needs to be an exposure i think a congressional hearing would definitely be a mechanism to look at if there's been white house ethics violations all of those things absolutely so, you know absolutely. if there's been crossover between hillary rosen between anita dunn and i mean all of that like was there secret meetings at the white house if so that's that's an ethics violation yeah so yeah, so we'll see. I mean, I don't know if anyone's going to take that on, but I would welcome it if they did, especially if it was one of the squad. That would be better, right? If yeah. one, one of those people who says they're a survivor actually did something in Congress that was yeah. for survivors. Yeah. That would be thanks. Nice. I'm happy, happy to join in the call on that. AOC, do your job. Do your job. Call an investigation. Make this happen. <laughs> and I, um, I, I don't think I have it on me. I, I'll probably cut it in later. But I wanted to, show, I, <laughs> I wanted to show you a TikTok um, of, like, it came out right during the, um, uh, the primaries, and um, okay. it was of a girl who I don't know. She was young probably like in her early twenties and she's just like in her like tie dye pajamas or whatever, you know, shaking like a pill bottle. And she just was screaming at the top of her lungs, chanting, please don't make me vote for Joe Biden. Democrats, please don't make me vote for Joe Biden. Please don't make me vote for Joe Biden. Please don't make me vote for Joe Biden. I don't want to vote for Joe Biden. <laughs> And that was because of you. That was because of you. A lot of it was because of you. And I, mm -hmm. I, you know, you were the turning point in making me realize that how much Joe Biden is actually lots, you know, like Trump. And he's done a lot of things since he's been elected to prove that he's a lot like Trump like and he's Trump. forward a lot of his policies. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I, I just really see you, um, you know, I, I connected with you in that on that. So you were one of the things that really, you know, started to radicalize me because I wasn't, you know, I didn't come into the Bernie crowd uh, until much later. Um, and uh, I've always been more of a feminist than anything else, even though I'm also a socialist. Um, so, you know, I paid more attention to your story, I think, than I other people's. And I, I don't know, I, I just, you know, I just personally want to thank you for 
coming out and, and doing what you do because it's, it's beautiful. And I also love that, you know, um, I would love to talk more about uh, your upcoming podcast and um, the articles that you've been writing for RT as well. They've been excellent. Um, you know, it, it's awesome to see that you're coming out and you're not, you're not just like, you know, letting this one incident sort of become you, you know what I'm saying? Like you're coming out and you're mm -hmm. showing everything about yourself and every intelligence that you have, you know, and that's really, that's beautiful and empowering to me because again, like I, you know, I, when you see survivors in the media, you see them either as, you know, like the crying survivor or as like the, you know, unfortunately it's, you know, I call it the choice between Mary's, right? Like Mary mother or Mary, you know, the prostitute and like that you're painted one way or another. Right. So, um, I, you know, it's beautiful to me that you're coming out as a full person and you're not, you know, like you don't have to sort of cling to one thing, you know, I don't know. What do you no. think about that? Is that weird? <laughs> no, no. I think the rape myths are, are all around us. You know, I mean, um, you saw them come out in full force with my, my coming forward and it's 2021 nothing's changed since the 1990s, which is unfortunate and it needs to, because come on, we're, we're, we've got to move you past the, all of this. And, um, you know, I, I think that I've been fortunate enough to have this love of writing. And so writing is sort of my cathartic way of dealing with things. And I pretty good at it. And, um, you know, I was lucky enough to land with RT doing the op-eds and I'm really happy to be with them. I'm really proud. They have a lot of really talented people working for them and I'm lucky that they select my op-ed. So, um, so that's given me a platform to, to have my voice and I get to choose what I want to write about. And I have a lot of freedom and I love that. And that's important. And then of course my novel, which, um, I did the memoir which is nonfiction. And then the novel is fiction that's called the last snow tiger. And I'm trying to have that finished by, um, this fall, um, or winter at latest. Um, oh. and I had to kind of re regroup on that, but it's called the last snow tiger, like I said, and, uh, New York times referenced it because, um, I had been writing the novel and studied about Russia. And so one of the things they came at me with was that I was a Russian agent. So <laughs> you know, whatever. Yeah. And um, I just sort of leaned into it. I just was like, right, whatever. Okay. I'm a Russian agent, like whatever. So um, yeah, I would be the worst one ever because like, I have no useful information, but okay. Um, so, and, and, and plus I, I'm pretty open. So I, I don't think I'm very stealth, you know, whatever. So uh, I, I think there's many reasons why I would be bad at it, but also I'm not. So that's that. So it was just weird that the New York Times and Washington Post harped on that. And so it was, and the Atlantic and um, who else? AP, CNN. But it was always like kind of humming underneath. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't believe me for this reason, well, don't believe it for that reason. They had to have layers of reasons or like make me so unlikable that then no one would believe me. So right. that was the other technique. So let's make her so unlikable that even if you did believe her, you don't like her. So, you know, and, and it's, it's a technique that PR uses and, you know, Joe Biden paid 2.2 million for his PR. So according to FEC, so that's what you get. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that makes me ill and I'm so, I'm sorry that it happened to you. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome to see your attitude despite that you have a really positive and a warm attitude. So that's amazing to see. Um, and, uh, you know, I, it's weird. Like I really believed in the Russia gate crap, uh, during the Trump era, I big time believed in the Russia gate. Yeah. I, I had a weird, like I had a Ryan Knight sort of come to Jesus moment when the primaries happened. And, and mm -hmm. recently as, as this primary, I even voted for Hillary, um, back in the day, uh, because, you know, she was a woman and I didn't think any more about it. Um, and, uh, anyway, so, um, 
yeah, I, uh, I really, I really bought into it. I listened to a, a podcast called Gaslit Nation, and they were, you know, very much about breaking down all of the, you know, connections Trump has to Russia and stuff like that. And a lot of this stuff is facts. A lot of that stuff is like, you know, yeah, he has friends in Russia and yeah, he has apartments over there and they have apartments here and whatever, whatever. But at the same time, it's like, I don't, I didn't realize that the same type of, you know, the same type of corruption was happening within the DNC. It was happening with, you know, a lot of different, you know, like Biden has connections to Russia too, right? Like, <laughs> like you yeah. can't be in the political game, right? And not have some connections to, you know, Russia, I, I would think at some point, they're right? Not, like, they're not our enemy, right? And they're, they're not, not our enemy. <laughs> enemy that's that's propaganda we're economically i mean right now they're capitalists obviously and they're economically intertwined on in an international community of economics um investments and all of that and energy and and technology and commerce all different kinds of commerce and you know if we had a more cooperative relationship with them imagine the innovation and the things that we could do yeah just collectively it would be amazing because it would be such a great partnership it's such a missed opportunity that we're demonizing a whole country and using xenophobia you know message yeah. of fear and like you mentioned that you believed it well you have rachel maddow getting paid millions of dollars to sit there and cram that down your throat every day just shouting 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 yeah. it's, it's so sad it's so disgusting and like you you don't hear them doing that to us they don't and you yeah. don't hear the Russian president do that to us. Um, I think that, you know, I just kind of feel embarrassed sometimes by America and how juvenile our discourse is and how when you, if you go to, if you expand your world and go to anywhere in Europe and you talk about geopolitical landscapes, it's such a different conversation. And it's, there's a lot more emotional intelligence and that's what our country is lacking. It's lacking emotional intelligence and we need to elevate the conversation and move beyond it and xenophobia and bigotry just has no place right now in in trying to solve some of the problems we need to solve like climate change and, and other things that's just my opinion yeah a million percent a million percent and you know frankly i'm tired of seeing you know like at this point sorry, geriatric politicians make decisions that are essentially kicking the can down the road for our generation. I'm really sick of it. And I, you know, I don't, I mean, cause the other thing, you know, the other thing is that Biden is really just getting up there. No, you know what I mean? And I, again, I took care of my grandpa. He had dementia. I saw it happen to him, how it gradually started and then got worse and worse and worse. And I see some of those things in Biden. Honestly, it scares me, you know? And so we, I, you know, I, I personally would like to see, uh, you know, some legislation floated about an upper age limit to be president um, eventually. But, you know, at this point, like i i really feel the t the tides are going to turn for you as you said before because i you know we were we were so relieved that trump was gone so relieved and now we're starting to see that our lives are not any better whatsoever we literally have less money from biden from covid and the stimulus than we do from trump how ridiculous is that i know yeah <laughs> I know. And then unemployment benefits just ended. Yeah, I yeah. know it's um, the pandemic is raging, the variants are, are surging, and they're not doing anything about it to really systemically address it. Yes. Um, because they're afraid politically of what it would do. Well, newsflash, it's done. Like the damage has been done to the Democratic Party. They've all done it to themselves. Yeah. And 2022 is going to be a bloodbath. I mean, it's just going to be a mess. And they know it. And they see it in the numbers because they're not there's 40% of the base that want a higher income minimum wage. They want Medicare for all. They want, you know, they want eviction moratoriums. They want help to stay home during the pandemic. Yes. And every other country developed nation anyway, has been paying workers to stay home and giving some sort of stimulus except ours. Mm -hmm. And I think the sooner that we address this, the better. I mean, the sooner that we address the politicians' unwillingness to take a political risk and say, shut it down for two months so that we can like 
have this over. As soon as we can say, forgive all student loan debts and really fight for that. Like they, they gave the sort of, I don't know, virtue signaling or whatever, but they didn't really do anything. They could have, like Biden could have ended student loan debt and he didn't. Yeah. So again, you have almost half the base that wanted that. You have 70% of the country that wants Medicare for all. You have a majority of the country that does not want any more, you know, foreign interference with wars. They want us to work on our own domestic policies. So do it. Forgive the student loan debt, raise the minimum wage, you know, change these things. And um, he kept talking about bipartisan reach out. There's no bipartisan reach out. There's none to be had. Like, what, what are they doing? They have the House, the Senate, and the presidency, but they won't for long. So either mm -hmm. make change or don't, but don't talk about it. Do it. Yeah. That's what I say. Yeah, 300%. Yeah. And, and then if you criticize any one of them, they get, they act like it's the end of the world and it's ridiculous. You, yeah. you have all the, on social media, you have all what they call the blue MAGA come out, the people that are yeah. just like, well, they're troll, little troll farms. They pay these troll farms, troll bots to just come out and just spew a message, talking mm -hmm. points. And um, nothing's going to change until we really address all of this in a systemic way. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. And I, you know, I, I don't believe that you know, I personally don't believe that it's going to be as easy as getting money out of politics or voting in more progressives. You know, I mean, I think that, that we're going to really need a multi-pronged approach of really making change. And it's going to really have to come from the people. Um, I and, you know, Yeah, and people yeah. need to stop thinking that mommy and daddy are going to take care of it because there is no mommy or daddy. We are the right. government. We have to take care of it that's a democracy if you really want a democracy then that's what it is it's you being participating in it not just by voting for someone who you think is like a father figure a grandfather figure to do things and be in the, and continue the patriarchy it's about upending things that don't work and not going with the status quo and trying innovative things that do work and you know whenever politicians do that there's a little bit of backlash but it it, it's effective. And I mean, for all their criticism of like, for say Russia, Vladimir Putin took their country out of abject poverty. He mm -hmm. took it out and gave them back a middle class within a decade and kicked out the oligarchs that were robbing the country. <laughs> you know, yeah. we don't have anyone regulating our oligarchs, American oligarchs. If we did, they'd be paying taxes, you know, like Jeff Bezos or some of the other American oligarchs. Why aren't they paying taxes? That's my point. So people always get all up, you know, whatever about, you know, Russia, whatever. I'm like, well, they, they control their oligarchs. Like they're, they're doing it. Like, why can't we, why can't America, why can't we get just the basics of them to pay? Can you imagine making millions of dollars to, to be a, where they're at and then not paying one bit of income tax. That's amazing to me. Mm -hmm. And they still get away with it. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. like these laws, I, there are laws on the books that are enforceable now. It's a choice mm -hmm. that they're getting, you know, like th that they're yeah. being allowed to get away with it, the choice. Yeah. And uh, exactly. yeah, I, I, and I, and I believe also that, um, you know, we, we talked a lot about 3D chess, right, in 2020. Um, and we talked a lot, uh, you know, about, you know, how, you know, they, the, the squad essentially was trying to make moves um, behind the scenes and whatever. But I think that, you know, we were waiting for them, you know, we were waiting for them uh, to be our leaders, as you said, when in reality, you know, they, they are the pieces. They are the pieces on the board. Okay, we right. have we are the players. The workers are the players. Workers against the the aristocracy. I like to call them. Um, you know, essentially, the, those are the two sides, and we need to treat the squad and we need to treat our representatives in general as if they are the pieces on the board, and we have to encourage them to move in the way that we want them to do so. So, uh, you know, on that. Well, note, yeah, I I don't know. I mean. I, I think that it's even deeper than that. They, the, the criticism of the squad has been, has been, you know, necessary, but <clears throat> we want to stay away from misogyny and because there's been a lot yeah. of misogynistic attacks on them. So, <clears throat> and that's yeah. been my argument with that. There's a lot of ways, there's a lot of ways to, um, I'm sorry, did you want to say 
Did I cut you off? No, no, that what I wanted to say is that I just feel like they're just one person, like AOC is just one person, Cori Bush, one, one person. They're doing what they can do in a system that doesn't want them to do it. So really mm -hmm. who we need to go after is Nancy Pelosi and Chuck sure. Schumer and Dianne Feinstein, who's like fossilized in her chair. Yeah, <laughs> so. that's for sure. No, I completely agree with that. But I think there are many yeah. ways to pressure someone. And I don't think that mm -hmm. yelling at them all the time is necessarily the most productive way of doing it. I think that there are ways that we can pressure our Congress people that are, you know, sort of like the carrot and the stick. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we reward you when you do I think good. We can evolve, even even evolve past the carrot and the stick. Let's look at it as as more of a collective conversation about what's working, what's not. Okay, it's not working to have an unhealthy workforce. I mean, why are you going to have a workforce that's unhealthy if you're a capitalist? That doesn't make any sense, right? It's not even logical. So why not pass Medicare for all where you can do more preventative health and you can help have a healthy working class? Um, it's, it's like with sexual assault, it's like having the conversation. Well, okay, let's not put sexual predators in power. Let's not cover up for them. Let's not enable nonprofits to be a catch and kill like Time's Up did. You know, so it's, it's making practical suggestions and having a conversation. Um, so you move beyond the carrot and the stick and you move to reality, what's working, what's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, so. that's, good. that's an excellent point. But I, you know, I do unfortunately think that it, you know, has to do a lot more with, you know, who's pulling the strings behind the curtains than, uh, you know, what AOC thinks is a person. Um, and right. I, you know, I think that um, what what I'm trying to express is that, you know, it it's not, you know, yet yeah, like the public are people that we need to convince, right? Like like the like the arguments mm -hmm. that we make, we are important to make in the media, in the public eye, um, and to get your talking points out there. But when it comes to dealing with your Congress people, I really believe that, you know, we're in a power struggle between corporations and grassroots activists, right? So that's, that's mm -hmm. kind of what I was getting at. And I absolutely do not. Oh, support, absolutely. Yeah, I absolutely do not support misogynist pressure. I've certainly been the recipient of a lot of misogyny in my life. I do not <laughs> encourage it. So yeah, yeah no, that's not what I was trying to say. And yeah, they are yeah, oh I know you're not trying to say that, but I'm saying yeah, like what I've been seeing online is you'll see people that just kind of pile on and then do that misogyny thing. It's like I don't agree with a Kamala Harris on a lot of things. She's pretty conservative de Democrat to me. She's pretty mainstream. But I didn't like what I saw when they were like accusing her of, you know, sex trade for power. It was ridiculous. She worked hard to get where she is and it had nothing to do with sex, but you saw those misogynistic comments coming from liberals coming from, you know, I just think neoliberalism in general is going to destroy our country more than conservatism. It's going to be like a combination of those two, just like wreaking havoc. Yes. We need to abolish it. We need to have a different view and i think you bringing up ryan knight is a good point he has some really practical views on the matter he's really something he's really a, you know a good independent thinker he is he's excellent i love the way he puts everything and i there's a reason that i i say that my progression is like a ryan knight progression because he really you know mm -hmm. i he expressed what i lived i felt like while i was doing it yeah. right you know so um that's yeah. specifically why i say that and uh Hopefully I'll get him on my show one day. We'll see. But, <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, so, he's, he's uh, person, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, what was I, what was my point? Yeah. Oh, there is a lot of misogyny on the left. Let's not even pretend. Right. So like, let's go back to yeah. that for a second, because I, I don't care how communist you think you are. I don't care how, you know, whatever like how anarchist equalist whatever whatever you want to call yourselves i don't care if you are telling women that their opinion is wrong 
because you can't out argue them. If you're telling women that their place is in the kitchen, which I've had people say to me when I make an argument that they can't be, <laughs> if you if you are presuming things about women that are stereotypical and then you know coming at them with that in a negative way in online or in person, like that that is unfortunately expands the you know spans the entire political spectrum that that ability right and it's it is not just men it is also women that perpetuate that toxic masculinity right that you know um the patriarchy so you know i i, I absolutely agree and i think that every time we see it on the left we need to call it out because that's and that's not acceptable i i came to the left because this is where i felt safest i felt safest as a woman i felt safest as a you know lgbt person um, you know, like I, like I came here for solidarity. I didn't come here to get another man telling me what I can and cannot say or do. Right. So exactly. that's why not start this podcast for that reason. Right. So, <laughs> you know, uh, I, right. I think, yeah, the more that we talk about it, the more we make it unacceptable. And I, I'm really glad that you brought that up because it's not okay. Yeah. 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 I agree. Yeah. And thanks for, for all you're doing. It's really important that we support independent podcasts. And um, you mentioned I was starting one and I have one that's coming out soon. It's called um, the politics of survival with Tara Reed. Yeah. So, and RT was kind enough to give the platform for that. So I appreciate them and um, yeah, and it's going to be really, really wonderful to uh, be able to explore different issues and kind of move beyond what happened to me, but onto other things so absolutely yeah. i'm so excited to, to hear what you have to say and uh on a lot of mm -hmm. subjects i i want to hear your voice you are I, I like i said i identify with you a lot yeah you, you you sort of made me feel like it was okay to speak out a little bit even though i'm not a survivor <laughs> i just identify with well you. you know you're a good troll slayer i noticed like seeing you on twitter and i really appreciate your support um oh thank you i've seen you out there really defending survivors in general and and talking about the subject actually i'm mis misogynistic and you call it out and you're really good and um i really appreciate that i think thank that you. you've uh you've got a good vision for you know how we can go and i knew it's really hard to leave the democratic cult as rose mcgowan called it yeah it. and you saw our, our our talk that we did together um but yeah she 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 coined it and it's true it's almost like uh it's almost like a deprogramming isn't it like you had to go through the ryan knight deprogramming yes <laughs> and, the, and the peter dow and you know yes. and kind of and and you know what's really been sad for me has been seeing some of the lefty fights um, because I have this great admiration for Glenn, Glenn Greenwald, but then I also support um, Chelsea Manning and that happened last week and that was super sad to see because I think both of them are amazing. I don't know either of them, but personally, but I just know of them and Glenn Greenwald has done this amazing investigative reporting and Chelsea Manning is a hero and has gone through hell and beyond and then yeah. um, and is quite the activist and then you have, um, you know, I spoke out in defense of Ryan Grimm, who you wouldn't know, I wouldn't be here on your show if it weren't for Ryan Grimm. Ryan Grimm was the bravest journalist who uncovered to the first piece on Time's Up. And he all that is the foundation for all the investigative reporting that has been done to date. And it's because of Ryan Grimm. And he brought, he kind of brought to light the corruption. He broke the Blasey Ford, he broke my story. And then I was on Katie Helper, um, but he's an amazing, investigative journalists. And I also adore Jackson Hinkle and I think he's amazing. And then he was criticizing Ryan Grimm, but in a kind of a way I didn't really like. And <laughs> I kind of inserted myself in the conversation and said, please stop. Cause I keep getting these people on there criticizing Ryan Grimm. And I feel like saying to them, look, you wouldn't even be on my Twitter. Like you wouldn't know who I was if it wasn't for this person <laughs> saying this happened. He didn't, if he was an establishment shill, he would have never covered my story. He took so much heat professionally. And wow. so did many like Katie Halper did, Megan Kelly, all of them that covered my story took so much crap professionally. Yeah. And Rose McGowan got suppressed. She had her music that was coming out. New York Times basically wouldn't cover her anymore because of her wow. support of me. So 
I feel the sense of responsibility when I see, you know, someone going out, Ryan, it's like, I feel personally responsible for some of the heat he took professionally, just covering my story and Rich McHugh, same thing. Oh. And um, I don't know, like, how do you, what do you do? Like, how do you, like, I, I, I feel like it's the elite's dream to have the lefties go at it, right? Mm -hmm. Or people with leftist kind of views. Right. It's hard. And uh, it's funny you mentioned that because I, I'm working with a group called United Left. And what we're trying to do is exactly that, trying to, you know, pool all the fires and get us to work together on issues we agree on. Um, so, you know, it's, it's difficult. And this, this stuff is really passionate. But I think it's important for us to remember that some of the reason that we have this infighting is because it gets other people noticed and it gets clicks. Right. And like, as not, I mean, as oh, not yeah. official as that is, unfortunately, like that yeah. is how the internet works. And unfortunately, these people need to make a living. Right. So, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it makes sense maybe for Jackson Hinkle to rip on Ryan Grimm because he's trying to get in with the people who hate Ryan Grimm crowd or something, you know, and like that, you, that's unfortunate. But I think as consumers of leftist media, we need to take it with a grain of salt. We need to recognize that, like, if we all were in a room together, I've had my beef too, you know, like I, again, I've been around for five minutes, but I've had my I beef with people too. And if I were in a room with those people, I would still shake their hands and have a friendly conversation. If Ryan Grimm and Jimmy Dore were in the same room together, they would probably shake hands and have a friendly conversation for mm -hmm. half a minute. Jimmy Dore would probably say something in, you know, uh, <laughs> that would incite uh, something, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. You know, but, I mean, but you know, it made me lose, but we need the Ryan Grimm's like, okay, like I, I really appreciate like you and other podcast commentators, like, and Katie Helper is a podcast person that's, you know, she's not an investigative journalist. I appreciate all of, you know, and Jackson, same thing. He's a podcast, he, you know, host, and he's a, you know, not an investigative journalist, but we need those. We need Glenn Greenwald. We need Ryan Grimm because yes. there's so few. Like there's so few and rich and rich McHugh. And there's certainly even fewer that are trauma informed. So that even more narrows the, the, the playing, you know, the game. Um, and what I, I guess my, if they're going to criticize some, somebody, why pick someone who actually isn't going to talk openly about their politics because they can't, because they're an investigative journalist. Um, it's really not their role. Like, I think, you know, that's, I don't even know what Ryan Grimm's politics are, but I know what they're not. I mean, yeah. if he were pro Biden, he would have never, ever had a conversation with me. He would have never then gone to the trouble of clearing my name, doing all that investigative reporting that no one else did to clear yeah. my name of the perjury. Yeah. And then, and then called out the time, New York times. I mean, when you're a, an investigative reporter to call the New York times is like, that's a big deal because you're calling out colleagues that could you know purposefully yeah. make it difficult for you to get seen your work to get seen yeah so i guess i just feel like some of these journalists that we are taking for granted are not getting awards and they should be yes. for their journalistic work they're like they're like doing all the hard labor and all the heavy lifting and then like my story went to the main if you noticed the intercept is the one that broke the Blasey Ford broke mine, broke times up, and then it went to corporate media. Mm. See, it used to be the other way around. Corporate media used to break and then independent media would cover it. Now it's independent media breaks it, or, you know, in that case, the Intercept did, and then they finally covered it because they were forced to. So I guess I, I really want that to be taken more seriously, um, that we have so few true journalists so why are you going to marginalize and get rid of one? Because yeah. you don't think he's critical enough of AOC. Who freaking cares? <laughs> like be critical of AOC, like on your own. Uh, that, that we really need good reporters. And if you're going to go after some reporters, go after the legacy media reporters that are suppressing and omitting real news and not covering the stories because of, you know, corporate, you know, ties. Yeah. Don't go after the ones that are. Like go after the ones who are working. It, it almost makes me wonder if, if they're play, if some of those people are plants, plants mm -hmm. to try to divide the left.
And that's what I don't know. Like, I mean, I know Jackson Hinkle obviously is not a plant, but I mean, other those trolls that are online and whatnot, are they? Yeah, I'm so, sure a lot. I'm sure a lot wonder. of them. Are. But the, I mean, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, you know, but I think there is also, you know, something to be said about. I mean, I think I think Ryan Grimm's issue uh, came to the forefront around like the force the vote thing. And then, you know, like, like Jimmy was really hard on him and then everybody piled on. And I, yeah, I also think that because he's still working for the intercept uh, and for rising after Crystal and Sager left and mm -hmm. they didn't they get bought out by a billionaire or am I thinking of something else? I don't, I don't know. No, you're Anything. thinking of something else. That was um, oh. when Turks got bought out by a billionaire. Right. Yeah. right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, I don't know about rising. I don't know anything about <laughs> rising. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, whatever. I don't, I don't follow this stuff. I, I, I don't have skin in this game, yeah. but you know, yeah. I, I think that, um, you know, my message to my viewers would be like, please take all of this infighting with a grain of salt and know that, you yeah. know, Ryan Grimm does amazing work. You're absolutely right. He does amazing work and we don't have enough investigative reporters. You're absolutely right about that. And we, we depend on them. And uh, certainly mm -hmm. the corporate media is just getting more and more fluffy and less and less substantial. And especially as, you know, more and more people are, are realizing that the system is, is, you know, eating them alive, essentially, um, then, you know, the less that the corporate media will be connected to reality at this point. Like you, you made a very uh, insightful observation that, um, you know, it, it's flipped that, uh, you know, like you could see that also with the BLM uh, movement last summer, a lot of the footage that the corporate news was using were was footage of people, independent journalists that were on the ground and just live streamed to Twitter. You know, I mean, that's, right. that's a huge difference. And I think that also means, you know, that we have a lot uh, more power than we think we do when it comes to grassroots media. And so that's why I'm so happy that if you were willing to come on the show and I, I'm so grateful that you, you're willing to take the time to do this with not just me, but other, you know, small uh, podcast hosts. And I, you know, I really, really appreciate it. And I, I hope that, you know, um, that I can continue to, you know, fight for you on Twitter and spread the good word. And, you know, um, again, like I, right now is a moment in time, right? Like right now is a moment in time. It's really hard to see out of it. But at the end of the day, I think a lot of women are gonna look at your story or look back at your story and say, wow, yeah, uh-huh, I see that. <laughs> I mean, that, yeah, 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 the history of it, yeah. Well, yeah. thank you, and we, we, need, we need to support each other and, um, and like you said, kind of unify the left in the sense about certain issues and um, that we're trying to get forward and get forward to the public um, in a way that's, you know, we can make systemic change. So thanks for all you're doing and having me and, um, you know, look for my podcast that's coming left, yes, you know, please. and um, that's uh, Politics of Survival with Tara Reed. And then check out my book, Left Out, When the Truth Doesn't Fit In. And hopefully yeah. you like it. Yes. So, you yeah. will everyone will like it we all want you to do the audiobook i know other people have asked you about that <laughs> i but, am working on it i have been a procrastinator i am working on the audiobook as we speak so yeah <laughs> yeah so it is but, coming but go read it because i'm gonna i i read it and uh i read it on my kindle and i'm still gonna download the audiobook when it comes out because i, I want to hear you read it so <laughs> oh yeah. thank you it's yeah, and, I, and I, I am doing voices. So I am imitating voices. So you even hear oh. me do a, a, a Ronan Farrow imitation. So it's awesome. So. <laughs> that is exciting. And I, then I did, I did an inner, yeah, and I did, but they're all nice ones. I mean, like, you know, not, not, I mean, because I, I love him. He's amazing. And I love his book, um, you know, Catch and Kill, which people quote often. Um, and, uh, but I had some bad experiences with journalists and um, I do go into that. That was with Washington Post. Um, luckily, you know, Ronan, uh, Rich McHugh, Megan Kelly, Katie Halper, all of them were so gracious and kind. And I was very lucky. 
I was going to say Rose McGowan is amazing. She's been, she did the forward to my book. She's an amazing creative force and activist. She's like right there for survivors and her book brave is amazing. And her music that she um, did her music album, planet nine, she composed that it's beautiful. It's absolutely, and it has theta beats, which are very healing for survivors. So you put it, your earphones on and listen to it. And it's amazing. Yes, I did. I did listen to it and it's awesome. It's very relaxing. I can definitely meditate to it. So, and the book is amazing. Yeah. I, her, she is fire. What she says is fire. The way she says it is fire. I ought, I, I do recommend <laughs> her audio as well. So absolutely. So yeah. Have them. Yeah. So anyway, thank you. And yeah. um, we'll talk again. And I hope I see you at the troll slaying in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely let's let's look let's do it absolutely okay Thank you so much okay thank you have a good one take care you may have noticed that i don't do live streams it's a lot and i'm like one person okay but i would still love to be able to uplift your voices the way that live streamers do by highlighting your chats or your indie businesses because i know how hard it is for a millennial out here and I'm happy to share my platform with people who support me. If you would like to see your comment or small business promo, scrolling at the bottom of my screen, then go to co-b.com slash millensplain and buy me a coffee for $3. If you would like to ask me a question and actually get a response, then buy me two coffees at $6 and I will put your question in my next Q&A episode. If you would like to insult me, I can take it. I got a thick skin. And honestly, I have a good sense of humor as well. Like my upcoming Q&A episodes, I will be doing special insult episodes. So if you would like to see your insult on my insult highlight reel episode and possibly get one back, then please buy me two coffees for $6. Then I'll be more than happy to clap back. Now, listen, I've been through hard times myself. And if you're really, really struggling and trying to start a business, if you need mutual aid help, you can always message me on Twitter um, or at melensplain at gmail.com and I will try to help you. That goes for anybody who needs to escape a bad situation to anybody trying to start a small business. It's important to me that I lift up all of our voices and not just mine. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, this is my second side hustle. I love being able to speak out on these issues, but the reality of the situation is in this capitalist hell that we live in. If I don't make any money from doing this, then I have to stop doing it altogether. Right now, living paycheck to paycheck for me doesn't actually even cut it. That's why I need your help. I don't have a Patreon. I can't offer you more content than what I put out publicly. I don't have the time, I don't have the money, and I don't have the energy. If you wanna see more content and you want special member features, you have a PayPal account that you can donate to, then support me and together we can make it happen. If not, I will fade away into the ether. <laughs> As always, for all my links, please go to melensplain.com. Thank you.